everyone. Uh, today I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I bring special welcome to anybody who is of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander here today. Welcome. I'm Kate Gooden and I have the best job in the world. I am the head of Alexa for Australia and New Zealand. Did you know that Alexa is 10 years old this year? It's come such a long way in those 10 years from the Pringle can all the way to being probably one of the most frequently used AIs in people's homes. Over the last five years in Australia, we've worked really hard to make sure Alexa is authentically Aussie and Kiwi so you can ask and she'll know how to do a shoey and how to spell Woolloomooloo, which trips me up every time. Tom. Thanks for that, Kate. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Tom Glover, uh, Senior Innovation Delivery Specialist here at AWS. Basically, I get farmed out as product designer and product manager to help customers just like you innovate on the AWS platform. Um, so today, we want to give a bit of a sneak peek under the hood around how Amazon does product management right. Really kind of want to open, open the door because we know that there's typically not a lot of information out there that's been publicly shared on this topic, but we know that it's a highly debated topic in the industry right now. Um, today, we're going to kind of run through a series of Amazon businesses, kind of show how some of the key product management functions work and operate, and how they come collectively together to show how Amazon has the ability to launch innovative, uh, differentiated customer experiences at speed. And so one thing that I always like to say when, when talking about this, right, is, you know, your business and your strategies may look very different from Amazon's, right? We, we may oper operate in a different area to you, and that's totally okay. Okay. But we probably share that common desire to build and launch different, differentiated, differentiated customer experiences that delight our customers in unique and powerful ways. And so hopefully that's the one takeaway that you get from today, is being able to see how we do that and how you can launch that in your own business. Um, I want to start by uh, talking about you know, the idea of the product-driven operating model, right? Because it's, an, it's a concept that Amazon didn't really invent, right? But it's really this concept of applying Amazon's culture of innovation into an enterprise-wide operating model that helps us operate as the world's most customer-centric organization. It drives the way that we think about our customers, how we organize around those customers, but then how we build and or how we enable teams to experiment at scale and how each team can operate, right? And one thing that I want to say is these are not really just experimental concepts. This is truly how we run Amazon, right? And so I want to start um, by talking about Amazon Prime as an example of one of Amazon's product roadmaps. And so with this journey over the last 20 or so years, there has been a real relentless push to innovate on the behalf of Amazon customers. And Amazon Prime is a flagship offering of how customers and can think about the various product offers as product features, right? And so, you know, we may have started in e-commerce with Amazon Prime, you know, really focusing on shipping speed and our deep product catalog, and we're continuing to innovate in that space, but you can start to see how with the Amazon Prime product, we've continued to invent in new areas along the way. We've brought in digital uh, benefits like our photos product, and more, but then we've gone on to expand some of the offerings that we have, right? Besides bringing things like media with the Thursday night NFL um, delivery in, in the US, but we've also looked at our customers and our customers' customers on the platform, right? And so Prime Day is actually the biggest sales day for Amazon, but also for one, for our customers who are selling on the platform, right? We're really thinking about how do we solve their needs over time. And so when we think about this, how do we get to this journey, right? Amazon now has over 250 paid Prime members on, as part of the program. And so thinking about you know, Amazon and product innovation and, and customer obsession here is really thinking about our broader business, right? You know, Amazon now has businesses in things like robotics, IoT, conversational AI with, with Alexa and so forth. But how do we know that these resonate with customers, right? That's the constant question we're asking ourselves and hopefully 
you're asking yourselves in your own business. But it's really about having that relentless focus on finding durable problems for customers and then innovating on behalf of customers to solve that problem, right? We want to understand or find where we've been able to identify the need that's been unmet by your customer and then really where we think we can solve that. And so we've talked about the word product quite a bit, right? But what does the word product actually mean? Well, you know, as we see on, on the screen here, there's external facing products at Amazon, things like Prime, uh, Studios, Alexa, Just Walk Out, Pharmacy, and so forth. They're kind of some obvious ones for us. But then it's really about how we've extended that product metaphor, right? And so we've got internal products like Amazon's or AWS's go-to-market uh, migration acceleration program that operates in a product-centric discipline and it's got internal mechanisms within it. So what I mean by that, it's got a product manager who's responsible for developing that mechanism, taking customer feedback from that, and then enhancing that over time. A lot of this content today actually comes from an in another internal product that we have called Learning from Amazon, where there's actually a product manager who's responsible for capturing you know, insights about what our customers want, then developing that content, getting uh, team members just like Kate and I certified, and then capturing feedback to iterate upon that content over time. But Kate, over to you, what are some of the products inside Alexa? Sure, so product innovation is a core part of what we're doing every day at Alexa, and uh, my team's constantly looking for ways to not only improve our internal processes, but also how things are showing up to customers at the other end. Now, who's heard of the Disney movie Encanto? I think anybody who's kids is going to have their hands up. Me too. Uh, so you'll remember there was a really popular song called We Don't Talk About Bruno. Now, unfortunately, when that first was released, Alexa didn't know the song, which is disastrous if you've got kids asking for a really popular song that they want to hear. So the problem wasn't that we didn't have the song. We had the song in our catalogue. It was all routing correctly. All the pipe work underneath was all fine. So why wasn't it, why wasn't it working? So our team sat down and, and did a quick analysis of the data and was able to figure out that new tracks or viral tracks, say for those that are coming up on TikTok, were failing early on when they were first released. So we got together and thought, how can we quickly iterate on our existing weekly testing processes to be able to catch these early on and fix them and get them into production before customers knew any different? So on the first day that their favorite, the new Taylor Swift track comes out or the new Encanto track comes out, that's the next big thing, they would be able to play it seamlessly. So what we did is we had a look for sources where we could get new music release data. We added them to our weekly test schedules and we made sure that all of those new releases were tested ahead of the Thursday, Friday release schedule. That way, we could get things fixed and customers were able to stream their favorite tracks. This sort of innovation, it's a really small, simple fix for what could have been a really complex problem. And so what happened with that product is we got a lot of interest from other countries, other bigger teams within the Alexa business. And what we ended up doing was migrating it to a central tech team so they could own the piece of uh, the, the software and distribute it to those teams. Now, that piece of tech or that piece of, of, of invention that we created here in Australia is helping to reduce friction and defects across the entire Alexa experience globally. So pumped about that. Local invention for the whole world. Tom. Thanks for that, Kate. And really looking forward to you talking about experiments later on as we go in. So here's something that should be fairly familiar to you, right? It's the .com.au website. But I guess I've got a question for the crowd, and we can just use hand raising to make this sort of simple. But I guess I'm interested to, for you guys to, under, to let me know how many products you think are powering this uh, experience that's been shown on here. So raise your hands if you think that there's 50 products that are being uh, created for this. How about 100? Couple there. How about 200? How about 250? How about 2,000? 
a couple of people are looking ambitious. Um, it's actually, so when, when looking at this uh, Amazon.com.au homepage, it typically renders around 250 to 350 products depending on the type of experience that is displayed to the end user, right? It's really about being dynamic to the customer and really thinking about what they need and tailoring that experience over time. And so when we think about you know, a product like Amazon.com.au and simplifying this down, it's really thinking about almost each one of those widgets that was being shown on that screen as being an individual product itself. And that's really about how we approach organizing product teams as well. And so you can start to see now with this basic example here that I've highlighted, how the various functional elements like search, cart, display, promotions, all come together in this adaptive homepage framework. But each one of these elements, including that adaptive homepage framework itself, the thing that ties it all together, are organized into areas that are supported by one or more product teams, right? And so what I mean by that is when we think about one example, let's say the cart being there, you can see how that breaks down into further sub-elements. And so when we think about that, what might that be? Well, we've got different geos and we've got different deals, we've got different payment methods. And so we're really thinking about how do we organize these product teams to support the growth and enable them to experiment uh, w within their own operating area. And so, you know, when we think about that, just having a whole bunch of microservices didn't make Amazon agile and nimble, right? Instead, it's really about the way that Amazon organizes these products and service teams in this very specific way that gives them autonomy to enable them to innovate on their own and then run experiments, get that feedback, and then build upon the product that they deliver. And one thing I should say is, teams don't really just look after products, they really own them. They're really responsible for owning that entire life cycle of their product as well. And so, here's another illustrative example of how you can think about a business hierarchy as a product taxonomy using the Amazon Fresh business, right? Something that we don't have here in Australia, but something that might be familiar with you. And so, a product taxonomy, as you might know, is really that logical structure that's used to organize your prod product and applications and ensures everyone knows what to build, what to sell, and what to deliver, right? And so what's really great about the product taxonomy is that you can measure it from all levels, right? From individual products to the wider global portfolio like Amazon Fresh. But what this shows in this example that I'm gonna highlight here on screen is how you can think of a business like Amazon Fresh as a product taxonomy, particularly when a purchase is made. And so now you can see using the white squares on the screen here, how the buying function actually supports the Amazon Fresh business, right? You know, what use cases are covered, what channel has the customer interacted with, and then what are the core products and services or APIs and applications that actually came together to be able to deliver this customer experience. And so when we think about how does this help the product team, or maybe even wider, how does this help the Amazon Fresh business, well, it clearly defines you know, products that generate value or revenue for Amazon, but it also shows where maybe we've got supporting products that become a part of that buying process. It also helps us identify maybe where we've got duplication or gaps within our product portfolio. Maybe it can also help us when we think about, you know, I want to develop a new product. Maybe I want to be able to buy Amazon Fresh or a TV. What are all of the shared services that I might use from the existing service today to be able to help me uh, accelerate that delivery? But one thing that we like to think as well is it really helps us drive that prioritization, right? As I mentioned before, we can start to understand what are strategic products, but also what are the ones that are supporting, but also what are the ones that are legacy. So really it helps us enable us to think about, you know, where should we focus our efforts or where should we reduce the total cost of spend, for example. And so following this, I almost want to take a step and go back to university for a second, right? And think about, you know, the product life cycle. And so this is something that you've probably seen, you know, probably dates back to, you know, over 30 years or more, right? And it sort of highlights, you know, why a product-driven operating model in the first place. Well, it's because the way that traditional organizations think about, you know, product adoption is what you see here in the screen, right? We've got that gradual hump pattern that's very much what we like to think outmodeled in this world, right? That's not how customers adopt products anymore. And so when we think about um, technology businesses like Amazon or other digital native businesses who, who thrive on experimentations, 
But typically what you see here, right, in those early stages, we're running lots of experiments to understand what customers are using, using that feedback to quickly adapt our product over time, making sure that we understand that what we're delivering is a differentiated customer experience. Because what we also want to do as we go through this process is understand if you know, this idea or this product that we had, if it's not a success, we can actually quickly pivot or actually just kill the product overall. Because not all products succeed, right? I'm pretty sure there's some great stat out there around 90% of products actually die altogether. So with that in mind, I guess, Kate, I'm keen to talk a little bit more about product experimentation at Alexa. Uh, Tom, you're talking my language. I love experimentation, and my team will know that we're constantly looking for opportunities to tweak and improve the experience in Alexa, as I described with our new music testing tool. So, look, when it comes to experimentation, it's a foundational innovation enabler. If you're not constantly looking at ways to tweak and evolve your products and features, then you're never going to be able to evolve and innovate in your product category. Now, at any one time, we can have hundreds of experiments running on Alexa on different customer cohorts, on customers at different stages of their life cycle in different parts of the Alexa experience. Now, data is a key starting point when we're trying to figure out what experiments to run or what hypotheses we want to test. We do walk the store exercises to try and find opportunities as well. So uh, walk the store for those that aren't familiar with it. I'm not sure if it's an Amazon term, but we literally step through the customer experience. So if we step through a new customer experience, setting up an Echo device, grabbing their mobile app and going through and, for example, setting up their favourite music uh, provider, so a Spotify account or an Amazon music account. And this is a good way for us to find opportunities to streamline that experience and make it easier for customers. Because let's face it, not everybody is technical like a lot of the people here in the room. We get a lot of customers who come in and they need a bit of help setting up. And this is where some of our experiments come in. So my team has a regular huddle to discuss experimental ideas, bar raise those ideas because, you know, the first idea that you come up with isn't, isn't always going to be the best way to execute something. And then we plan what we're going to do around that. Now, at Alexa and broadly Amazon, experimentation really falls into about four buckets. So they can be educational or hints. Uh, so as I, I talked to you just before, um, say a customer is early on in their journey and they just need a little bit of extra help, say, setting a default music provider. The second one is engagement. So we're always looking to increase how broadly and deep customers are engaging with Alexa. And so we use hints within the customer experiment experience to help them find new features that they might like to enhance the existing features they're using. For example, you wake up every morning to an alarm, you might be interested in waking up to your favorite song or your favorite radio station. And that's one of the experiments that we've got running all the time. The third bucket is life cycle management. And this is how we kind of guide customers through those early days. Um, helping them to discover products and, uh, and features that might, they might be interested in, especially in that sort of first three months timeline. And at the other end, we might have a, a number of experiments to try and prevent our customers from lapsing if we uh, sort of detect that they're falling into a bucket of lower engagement. And these might be to introduce a feature that perhaps they haven't discovered yet that we know is gonna land, like shopping lists. It's a favorite feature of mine at home. The final bucket is new feature testing, and this is the really meaty A-B testing that uh, we really like to do, but it doesn't come along as often. So this is where you've got something net new, it might be a piece of technical architecture or a brand new feature or an iteration, and we're running that A-B test to see if there are any defects that we can't, haven't detected in our QA process, or to see if customers are able to use it as we expect. Now, I've got a question for the group again. I'm going to do a show of hands. So, how many times did your teams experiment this month? Have we got a show of hands for zero? Anybody brave? Thank you. How about 10? Great. 
Anybody done 30 experiments? The lights are very bright in here. How about 50? All right, 100, anyone? Yay, awesome. Um, look, I just, one thing that I want you to take away today, actually I'm gonna ask you to take away a few things, but this is my number one. Experiment more, please. Give your teams the opportunity and space to experiment and the time to think of things that they're gonna be able to do to improve and innovate on your customer experience. And also give them the space to fail because failure is all part of the journey and you can't learn without a few failures along the way. Alrighty, so we're gonna change tack a little bit now and we're gonna look at how we organize. Now, when I came to Amazon five years ago, I found product management was pretty different from my previous roles. I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I think it's the way that everybody follows these mechanisms um, and processes that have been in place for a long time. It helps to, to provide flow, and Tom's gonna get into some of those a bit later, so the PRFAQs and some of our planning processes. But what I love about this place is that experimentation is baked into everything we do and great ideas and products can come from anywhere. So when you're an Amazon product manager, you really are taking full end-to-end -end ownership of your product. So you're, the customer really is our guiding north. They are at the center of everything we do. We're constantly checking customer feedback and it really helps us to guide how we deliver on our customers' needs. Next is product planning and development, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but you're often running multiple projects and you're dependent on multiple teams, and sometimes you're feeding into multiple different product launches at the same time. You'll know from our fall launch events, we're often launching two or three different Echo hardware products at a time, and our product managers are having to manage through all those different timelines with their teams to deliver to meet the overall product guidelines. It takes real grit to be a product manager at Amazon. You have to be really amazingly skilled at high judgment calls. You have to be really comfortable in ambiguity. And you have to be really good at sort of keeping your team focused on the vision ahead, despite the distractions. And then you've got to look at your product portfolio. It's very rare that a product manager in Amazon and obviously all of your teams as well is only working on one product. So we're constantly looking at how we can tweak and manage our product portfolios. And if something's not working, we're really comfortable in sunsetting it if we have to. Go to market launch. Now this is obviously such a critical part of a launch and it's, it's all, when all of your uh, sort of the magical bits of the product process are coming to, pro, uh, coming to fruition. As we lead into the go to market process, we're often running really extensive beta programs with internal team members and this is across Amazon. It's a really sought after sort of thing to be on is the Alexa beta program and we're collecting data at scale. So what we're looking to do is test our products and experiences to make sure that, that one, they're gonna meet our customers' expectations. If not exceed, that is where we wanna be. And also to test it at scale in real customers' homes. And this helps us to detect any unexpected defects that haven't been captured in our QA process. All of that then feeds into a go-no-go -go process, which also includes inputs from QA, your development teams, your product leads, um, and all the different stakeholders that have been involved in that project. Operation or BAU, because we all know that product management doesn't stop at launch. It's really just getting going. And this is where our continuous innovation steps in and that all important experimentation process. You're monitoring customer feedback, you're monitoring the data, you're trying to understand how your customers are using your product and looking for opportunities for where you can tweak and improve that and drive that depth of engagement that you're looking for. 
And the final piece is people management. Now, a lot of product managers at Amazon are responsible for the strategy of their programs, and so they're also in charge of working out when is the best time to scale and grow their teams. And this is really critical, and we'll go into this a little bit later with the operational planning process. And shout out to my t amazing team who are here today. Tom, how did our teams formed? Cool. So let's double click down a little bit more on two pizza teams, right? And so what we mean by that at Amazon is no no ha no large how sorry, let's take a step back there. No matter how large your company gets, no individual teams shouldn't be bigger than what two pizzas can fit. It's debatable because <laughs> I don't know on a Friday night I might be able to eat two pizzas myself. But there's some pretty solid research out there that sort of suggests that as you add more t team members to our product teams, so does the number of links. And so what I mean by number of links there is almost the relaying of information and bringing everyone up to speed, which as you can imagine creates blockers and slows down the product development process. There's also some other solid research out there that sort of suggests that, you know, as you add more people to the team, they become overconfident. And so when we're thinking about product to product planning, we're almost over-quoting or under-quoting the actual time and effort it takes when we add more people to the component. So the, that sort of brings us to the idea here, or I guess to the point around saying, well, no matter how busy you get or if there's that ambitious product milestone at stake, you don't want to add more people to the product team because that actually slows down the team. They actually become overconfident and they under-deliver when it really gets going. And so the real question is though, is like, what is you know, a, the size of a two pizza team? Well, when Jeff was at the helm, he believed that it was six to seven non-ravenous people that was the idea of a two pizza team. Also, when we think about other comparable components around product teams, but also other industries, the US Navy SEAL team, they believe that four is the ideal size for a combat team. And then when we think about other technology companies, I know Amplitude, they believe that it's somewhere around five to 10 people for an expanding startup over time. So with that, let's go into looking at what an example product team or two pizza team might look like here at Amazon, right? And so if we think back to what I showed to you earlier, the amazon.com.au website, we've got a product team who's responsible for building standard components to live in a web experience. And so with that, we've got our product manager talking about the roles and responsibilities that Kate talked to earlier, where they're responsible for the vision, but also prioritization and really being that advocate for the customer, right? They're really being that, that voice and driving that vision over time. Then they're really supported by the standard resources that you would expect within that product team to be able to execute and deliver upon that organization. We like to think that this is kind of the hallmark of a good product team. But let's sort of flip that a little bit, right, and look at a different product team over time, right, and look at how this team composition might come about. So we're thinking about the a product team who's responsible for building the machine learning model that routes uh, delivery drivers from one residence to the next. So let's say I've just been delivered a package, How should we go to Kate's house next based on what I've got in my van? And so with this in mind, you know, note that the product manager is still responsible for the same things that they were before, but their domain is very different. But now at the same time, they're surrounded by the right resources to be able to execute across that vision, right? deep capability and machine learning and data science to be able to build that model. So Tom, when should we be looking at splitting up product teams then? And this is a great question, right, and something that we always get asked. And we have this metric inside Amazon called a fitness function, right? And so it's really thinking about how well can our team perform based on what they've got going on. And so when we think about splitting up teams, we're really looking at, are we at a point where we've got specialization in our product? Maybe we want to break off a team who just focuses on the machine learning model of our component, or maybe we've got an extended product backlog that we might want to then split out by two different product teams. Maybe we're also thinking about what's the cognitive load that's riding across these product team members, really thinking about getting them very focused on their exact delivery with it. So Kate, with that, we've looked at a couple of examples of actual product teams. How about we look at an organization like Alexa with two pizza teams? 
Sounds great. So the, this is just a sample. It's not uh, hard and fast, but basically we have dozens of product teams working across our AI, shared services, verticals like audio, and then of course the Echo hardware. So each team has the roles necessary to deliver the products they built. They're stable, so they've got a consistent set of people and that means that they're really quick to make decisions because they're all on the same page. And if they're not on the same page, they can hash it out if they need to. And then they all either directly or dotted line report into the PM. Now, while it's often effective in uh, emerging tech and new product development, um, this is also really effective in just big products. When it comes to software development and sort of those core software builder teams, there's a real you build it, you own it model in place. So as Tom said, with the two pizza teams, if that team pe creates a piece of software or a feature, they own that. And then if other teams want to onboard that, they own all of those processes, the maintenance, the, con the reaching out to them if uh, there's going to be an outage, all of that sort of stuff. So Alexa's vertical teams are typically split by discipline. Um, and you can see up here, uh, we've got a, a sort of a GM type role. And then you've got your product managers, which look horizontal and they're all sort of reporting into a PM leader. And then you've got your SDEs reporting into a SDE leader, data science, etc. And what that ensures is that those teams, they've got a community around them of people in the same job family that they're able to learn from and de uh, develop their skills. But then you'll also see vertically, I almost said horizontally, um, that you've got the PM lead and they're typically running a set of features and a product portfolio with those people. And so what happens is you've got a dedicated team who's familiar with the product, um, but then they're still retaining that, um, that development process that everybody needs. So Tom, now that we've had a bit of an insight into team structure, can you take us through how these teams come up with new products and services? Awesome, and so I'm lucky enough in my role to, to really apply this mechanism with a lot of AWS customers, right? And so every new product and service that we build at Amazon, you know, to drive this customer-centric thinking and execution is uses the working backwards mechanism. And so as I said, it's used across every product. It was, there was a great post by Andy Jassy, I think, um, three months ago we talked about Project Kuiper and so how that had been used as a working backwards pro project five years ago, which is pretty exciting, seeing the Kuiper um, team here today. But when we go through the working backwards process, we use this mechanism to making sure that we are building the right thing for customers and that we are being customer obsessed from day one, right? Because the output of the working backwards process is the PR FAQ, or also known as the press release, FAQ or frequently asked questions and visuals and I'll get into that in a little bit. And so when we go through the working backwards process, we have these five key customer questions that we look to answer as a product development team. And so no surprise, being customer obsessed at Amazon, it really starts with the customer, right? Really trying to have a deep understanding about that. But then from that, it's not about just an understanding of who they are, it's really about narrowing that down to what is the true customer problem or opportunity that they are facing. This is particularly important when we're looking at jumping into a new business venture, right? Like what's our role to jump into pharmaceuticals, right, as Amazon Pharmacy? We really need to think about the why behind this. Then it's about being very direct there in our think big component, right? Really thinking about what's the most important customer benefit. When we were developing these new products and services, we really need to think about what's the reason why someone's going to change from their existing product or their existing behavior into our new differentiated customer experience. Then it's really about how we describe that end-to-end -end customer experience and we use the PR FAQ that's about that. And then it's about being day one from day one, right? Really building that rich backlog of experimentation to make sure that we are building the right thing and having the data to support the investment that we need over time. And so with that, going through the working backwards process leads us to the PR FAQ, as I said. And so let's start with the press release as, as that 
first piece of document, right? It's that one page narrative document describing in customer centric language what the product vision is that we're going to be releasing on day one. I just want to press the piss to also say that this is an internal facing document. Although it's written like an external press release, it's never designed to actually be customer facing. And when I mean it's written in that customer centric language, I mean if we are designing something for doctors, then we'll use the language of what doctors understand. Or if we're designing for teachers, we'll use the language that teachers are very familiar with. And so what this really helps us is, is kind of get alignment on the product vision, but actually gets us real crisp about what it is that we're announcing on day one and really forces us to think about what's really important for the customer. And so when we go through writing this document, we're very focused on communicating who the customer is, what the problem is the customer has today, and then we're describing that solution. And I'll jump into to the template straight after this. Then we've really got the FAQs. And so whilst that press release document is just one page, the FAQs might be up to six pages long, right? And so we've got uh, customer facing FAQs. So what are the hard questions that customers are gonna ask us that we would anticipate when launching this new product and service? Like how much does this cost? Is this included in my prime membership and so forth? Then we've got the stakeholder questions as part of that, right, on the flip side. So really thinking about this as a business document, like how much revenue is this gonna generate for us? Is it, how is this a differentiated customer experience? What experiments have we run to make sure that we are building the right thing? And then more importantly as well as this is, what's the implications if we do nothing here and we don't build this? We need to really be honest with ourselves from day one. And then we really have visuals, right? Really describing the customer experience where words almost don't do it justice. And so, as I said, you know, every PR FAQ is going to follow this nine key step out structure um, that are hopefully this is something that you can take away and use in your own organization. And so you'll see, hopefully, if you can see it at the top here today, you can see exactly where we are announcing the press release, the date, but then we're following these key um, components to actually articulate the product vision. We're also being very honest with ourselves. You know, when we look at that component there of number three, we're sort of acknowledging that customers actually have a problem today. And that then we follow that up by the solution to say that we can actually solve that and this is what the solution is. The other part that I really like about this is the customer testimonial, right? And so when we write the customer testimonial, it has to be very realistic. Often we actually get the quote after doing prototyping with, with customers. But it's what is their experience that they would say about the new product and service after using it for the first time. We're not going to say something like, oh my God, this has completely changed my life. Kate, you've done an amazing world. Realistically, customers aren't going to say that right. But they're going to say something like, this has been able to reduce you know, my time by X, Y, Z, or, or something like that. We're trying to highlight the value that they have. Um, and so Kate, you know, we, we've talked about uh, writing this press release. What about the, the doc read process there as well? Yeah, so the doc read process is pretty unique to Amazon. Uh, first time you come in to the team and you have to sit down for a doc, it's kind of weird. We're sitting down for about 30 minutes with the doc to digest it, write some notes, uh, uh, think about questions we might want to ask. And then we come back and it's a group discussion. Everybody takes turns, it's very civilised. Um, and what you're looking for as a stakeholder is that all of the kind of data questions or the dependencies have been answered in the doc. Um, and often the discussion, if you've got t other teams there, it's going to surface other dependencies that you perhaps hadn't considered or it might uh, surface an opportunity that you didn't know about before that might help facilitate what you want to build. Overall, if you're a dock owner and you're coming out of it with things to do, that means the process is working correctly. What's next, Tom? Back to experimentation, but really about how we approach this from you know the idea of the PRFAQ. And I want to use a real life example and something that's also quite topical in the media um, this week, so we'll get to what that product is. And so, you know, Throughout this presentation today, we've talked at length, uh, Amazon's really focused on running these experiments, right? To ensuring that we're building the right thing, validating those top riskiest assumptions. And so at the start of, you know, going through this process of product planning or execution as part of that, we're really looking to kind of build fidelity through our experiments. And so this is actually a real life example from a product that we had and uh, the illustration from the first PRFAQ. 
as you can see on here, it's pretty lo-fi, right? But we didn't actually have a deep understanding about what that product is. And so as we go through the product development and experimentation process, we start building fidelity around what that product looks like. You can start to see in this execution, we're using things like Lego and building blocks to understand what the store layout might look like. We're then moving into, once we've understood the customer experience in detail there, really looking at bringing technology in, right? So understanding around how technology might play a role in this reinvention of customer experience. And so thinking about you know, that today, that actually led us to building the Amazon Go or Just Walk Out experience, right? And so for us staying customer obsessed and learning around how our customers are using the product, this actually led us taking an internal product as Amazon Go and then actually refining that and launching that as Amazon Just Walk Out because we knew customers just like you wanted to be able to deploy this frictionless shopping experience uh, in, in your own retail outlet. And so here's a great example of how the AFL and Telstra have used this in Marvel Stadium. Kerno um, kicks a goal and runs up to the himself. stands. He taps his card, supporters looking on. He scans the shelves, grabs a pie, and is gone. Get in, get out, get back to the action. Check out the runner, level one, aisle 18 and 28. Delicious. <laughs> Always wanted to say that. And so you can see from this, it's really about following that idea of Amazon's think big approach to product development, really rethinking the customer experience using computer vision to track people buying items in a location. But you can also look at that from a consumer perspective. I'm sure there's lots of sports fans here, but it's a pretty great experience to be able to leave your seat within 60 seconds, get a pie, get a beer, and get back to it and don't miss any of the game. Um, we're kind of running short on, on time here, so I thought we might skim through um, some of the stuff. One thing that I really want to touch on just quickly is MLPs, right? So I, I know you guys know the language a lot here around MVPs, but we often find that that's misunderstood. It's supposed to be validated learning, but we all know it's really what's a small number of features that we can deliver in the shortest amount of time. And at Amazon, we actually flip this, right, to MLP. So it's really about focusing on the customer there. So really saying, what were the features we need to deliver at launch that would deliver that differentiated customer experience that we know customers will launch? And then the same thing goes into funding, right? And so, you know, we've got lots of traditional funding methods that you and your own organizations would have. But then when we've got new products, we've got a lot of unknowns, right? And so our funding approach resembles something of like a VC firm or startup funding, right? And so we're sort of saying, as we release these MLPs, so is the funding realized as part of that, right? And so what's great for this is we sort of say, hey, we have this OKR or this goal to deliver this part of the product. It's going to drive this amount of value for our customers or adoption. If that is realized, then we get our next batch of funding, right? It's another way for us to reduce um, any issues with our products over time. What about product planning, Kate? So I'm going to whiz through this because we have one minute and 43 seconds till you guys can go and have lunch. Uh, so our planning process is really a combination of bottom up from the team, team inputs, uh, and also sort of partner team inputs, and then top down, which are coming down from the strategic division of uh, d a direction of our business. Then we're also layering in our long-term strategy, so where we want to be in two to five years' time. From there, we have two planning cycles. The first one is really taking all of those inputs and figuring out what sort of resources and headcount we need to deliver on that. Then we're taking it to leadership for funding. The second planning cycle is where we've got everything aligned, we know what we're able to deliver, and it's the plan of how we're going to do that. And so we're looking at uh, what milestones we're going to hit, we're tracking our, our progress via goals, um, and then that is our plan for the coming year. We track this via two mechanisms, uh, goals, which are basically red, yellow, green, you can kind of figure out how uh, the progress is there. Um, and then uh, our leadership is able to easily see what's tracking well and double click on anything that's red and yellow and figure out why. The second is the process around program management. And this is where a leader like myself can come in and see what stage beta is at, how it's all progressing, QA status, um, how go to market is going. And it's really great because this is either an email, a meeting or a wiki page 
and a busy leader like myself can just jump in in whichever way I want to and I don't have to sit in hours of meetings to get up to speed with a program. Tom? Cool, so let's give it the 30 second wrap up, right? This, the key elements of getting it right and how Amazon approaches product development. Always start with the customer and work backwards before you do anything, right? Make sure you have those insights to drive the right product adoption. Really re-envision your world as products, right? Don't treat things like a project. Bring in that life cycle. Look at life beyond the initial project that you're delivering. Organize your teams into product teams. Make sure they have the right resources to deliver across and execute that vision, right? And then to bring the work to the teams. Allow them to operate at the edge, right where the customer is. Experimentation, experimentation, experimentation. Validate what it is that you are building. And then as I said this, throughout this as well, own your own life cycle, right? Really take that you build it, you run it life cycle as part of that. And so that's how we kind of see the product driven operating model here at Amazon. And uh, there is some training you can take um, that has some components as part of product management. You can go off and find this on the AWS Skill Builder. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in. I know we went a little bit over time. Um, if you do have any questions for Kate and I, feel free to reach out to us directly or we might hang out at the yep. back here um, for them. But yeah, thank you so much. And uh, don't forget to give uh, some feedback at the end. You we know, we want to say customer obsessed, <laughs> understand what worked, what didn't. This is always an experiment, right? Um, so, so let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you.